making the slightest bit of sense out there, folks. Give me a, a nod or something. Yeah. You can only see three beautiful faces, you see. The rest of them are all off making a cup of tea. <laughs> or supping from a glass of sherry. Okay, so I'll keep going. Uh, once again, the, the you know, if anybody wants to ask a question, you can either put your hand up or unmute. There's only a few of us here tonight. But I'm, I am recording this for posterity. So... Over the next few months, there's going to be over, I don't know, 26 million views. So bear that in mind. <laughs> right. I, I like this. Um, this is something I read. Oh, let's not go forward to there. Let's just step by step. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Some of those beautiful scripture readings, right? So it's the parable of the great banquet. And um, a man once gave a great banquet. The Hebrew word for a man is Adam. And Jesus is with us as the new Adam. So Jesus is talking about himself. Hey guys, I'm going to give a great banquet. And I am going to send out invitations and my servants will go with the invitations, which is kind of like us. Um, and he's saying, come, for all is now ready. And in fact, I'm going to highlight that because that is the divine will. The great banquet of the divine will is ready. We can take possession of that. Once our soul is ready, okay? Come, for all is now ready. That is Luke 14, verse 17. But the people invited began to make excuses, okay? Which is what the people of the world do all the time. I don't have enough time to pray. I'll develop my relationship with Jesus when I get the next promotion. I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I need to do this, I need to do that. Excuses, excuses, excuses. The fact is, everything is now ready for you to take possession. And um, as a result, Jesus says, Go out to the streets and lanes of the city, bring in the poor, the, the, le the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Okay? And they do that. And then he says, Go to the highways and hedges, compel people to come in. Compel. Okay, that's the word used. That my house may be filled. The Greek word can be translated as force. Force people to come in. Now, the irony is that is not a word we like to use when it comes to say of the salvation of souls. But the, but the power that Jesus gives to the evangelist is dynamic, okay? The word used is dunamis. It is an explosive power that destroys strongholds. It is a force that cannot be reckoned with. So when Jesus is saying compel, he's, he means it. He's really, he has, you know, shed his blood so that we can take possession of this kingdom. Press, thank you, Susan. That's what you were doing. I was thinking, what is she doing? Pressing her nose up against the screen. <laughs> so Jesus wants us to press people. Okay, Gerard's question. Um, let me just see the question. Here we go. I'm saying prayers in the hope of growing in holiness because I understand you have to cooperate. It seems a very fine line. My prayers are motivated by the schools, so therefore they are, are they used to us. Okay. Mm. Where cooperation becomes pride. Okay. Well, okay, so this is a good question, Gerard. First of all, you're probably for the entire duration of your time on earth 
are going to be battling with pride. If you can recognize that you are proud and that pride is, it could be affecting your interior life, then you're already on the journey to humility. The hindrance is not recognizing pride. The hindrance is not recognizing vanity. The hindrance is not recognizing egoism. The hindrance is not recognizing the thing that is a weakness, your shadow side. Some people hate having their shadow side pointed out to them. They hate it. And that's, that's a very important thing. If you can see that you have this weakness, lust, anger, hatred, whatever. If you can see you have this in you, even though you're not acting on it and not living it out, then that is a great step forward in growing in the opposite virtue, whether it's humility or purity of heart or the glory of God as opposed to vainglory, etc. Recognizing it. Now, when I went to confession a few weeks ago, I confessed along these lines and my confessor said, this is excellent. He said, what a great confession. You have recognized it. You've brought it into confession. You'll probably be wrestling with this for the rest of your life. But the fact that you can confess that is very virtuous. Okay. So it's not a hindrance when you know your fault. It's not a hindrance. Not knowing the fault is a heck of a hindrance. Not recognizing it, denying it, that's a hindrance. All right. Now, so Jesus is compelling people to come in. And in fact, he writes that to Louisa. He says, I'm knocking on the door of people's hearts and I'm going around the world and I'm compelling people to come into the divine will because the divine will is the only protection against the coming chastisement. And Jesus is saying, there is going to be a flood, a flood of fire. There's going to be a global chastisement. Get into the divine will. It's the only refuge in the coming times. Yes, we have the Immaculate Heart of Mary, but guess what? The Immaculate Heart of Mary is in the divine will. <laughs> and this is the revelation for this time. All right. So that's Luke. Jesus is compelling us we should not resist um this is luke 16 verse 8 okay the sons of this world are wiser in their own generation than the sons of light. Let's take somebody from this generation. Okay. Let's take the great and famous Elon Musk. Okay. Elon Musk is a businessman. He's currently the world's wealthiest man. Last time I checked, he was worth around $250 billion. Mm, that's quite a bit of money there. And um, he knows how to make money. He knows how to invent stuff. Or his company does. He knows how to put stuff into outer space. Okay. So he's, he's sorted. He sleeps about five hours a night, if that. He doesn't sleep much at all. And he's driven. He's driven to develop He's driven to find new ways. He's driven to make his business successful. Really, really driven. Gives everything into it. Same with Bill Gates, who used to sleep when he was young and when he just started software development and so on. He would sleep at the office. They would work 24 hours. They would keep themselves going by drinking Coca-Cola, which was caffeinated and sugared. So that's how they would keep themselves motivated. It was 24-7, business, business, business. They, they weren't interested in relationships. They wanted to make money and develop software. 
You find this in the, um, the FTSE 100 business leaders. They're totally driven. They work 100 hours a week. They are all about the business. They're all about making the money. All right. This isn't me having a go at them. This is the sons of this generation. They know how to do this. Right, I'm going to spin this round in a minute and you're going to see what I'm getting at. Let's take another look at athletes. Athletes are totally driven when it comes to chasing after that medal. They will get up early to exercise, go to bed late while exercising. They will eat an appropriate diet. They will avoid alcohol and smoking and drugs and even... They'll, oh, okay, we've got somebody coming in. There we go. So people are driven to live their life in this way. 